Father, we thank you for your mercies. We appreciate you for everything. We thank you for giving us life. Thank you for keeping us alive. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for being our king, for being our Lord. We appreciate you. Unto you shall the gathering of your people be. We thank you for this midweek service and the things that you have said today in our lives. Father, we have come to renew our strength. We have come to fellowship. Let your precious Holy Spirit be available. Begin to pray and ask the Lord for a cleansing. Lord, in my, I submit my spirit to you tonight for cleansing, for you to ignite me tonight. Open my and pray. That the Lord will ignite us tonight. The Lord will touch us at the point of our needs. And the Lord will touch us at the point of our needs. The Lord will ignite us tonight. And the Lord will touch us at the point of our needs. That the Lord will ignite us tonight. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. Adonai, we worship you, Rose of Sharon, Rose of Sharon, oh, you are so good, Almighty God, tonight for bringing us at the place of your feet. Unto you shall the gathering of your people be. We pray that you enrich us tonight and you reach us with your mercy and in your power. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus name we pray. A bless you may have your seat. Hallelujah. We're going to hear the word then we pray. It's a midweek service, and in services like this, it's to draw strength from God in our walk and talk with Him. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. We'll be looking briefly on what I tie to. Building resistance as a Christian. Cultivating spiritual resistance, we could call it that. Cultivating spiritual resistance. As a Christian, how to cultivate it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Say, so Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. If you go down to the verse 6, it says, Remember your creator before the silver cord is loose or the golden ball is broken 
or the pitcher shattered on the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Verse 9, verse 13 now says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Praise God. So if you look at this scripture, you will realize that our lives on earth are not forever. And uh, when we fulfill our days and come to the end of our lives, there is a season of accountability. And from what we've learned so far, the enemy wants to, to make sure that every human being on earth, when they fulfill their days and they come to the place of accountability before God, they will be given the same sentence that he received when he was driven out of heaven. So Satan wants us to share in his eternal judgment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 that the, the lake of fire or hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you understand me? By now we know all that. Why do I call our attention to that is because the scriptures that we have read is telling us to remember. Remember the first one, remember your creator. Second one, remember. So when you see God repeating himself twice, he's telling you something very, very important. And you cannot remember if your memory is not functioning. Do you understand me? And when the Bible says remember your creature is beyond memory. It's talking about be acquainted with him. Put him ahead of your life. Let him influence every detail of your life. Let him be at the center of your life. Let him be your all in all. So in the Old Testament, he was not that close to them. He was like a deity. But in the new, he became close to us as Jesus Christ. When he stepped down and we cannot relate with God and fulfill that instruction. Of remembering our creator. That should also tell you part of the aspect of our lives that warfare is going to surround. You get my point? Warfare is going to surround this aspect of remembering our creator in everything we are doing. So when people make up their mind to enter into a relationship with Jesus and they begin their journey in Christ, just know that that is a declaration of war. Are you understanding me? When you just make up your mind to begin a journey with Jesus, you have actually declared, you have actually made a declaration of war. So it's not just a decision for salvation. It's a declaration of war, except your salvation is not genuine. So in case you're writing, you can write it down. Every genuine salvation decision is a declaration of war. Every genuine salvation decision is a declaration of war. Every genuine salvation decision because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is that not? For the wages of sin is death. So when man fell in the garden, the devil thought he has had everybody. So when you now declare for Jesus, he knows he has lost you. Do you understand me? So that is why it's a declaration of war. So say with me, every genuine salvation is a declaration of war. Now, one of the major things you must know as a Christian, we is, who is serious with God, not everybody. You get my point? Know that when you, when you wake up in the morning and you maybe you pray or you do whatever, the devil wants you to go back to him, go back to your old ways, just get back to him. It's, it's a minute by minute um, wish, not just wish. He's not just wishing, he's working on it. You get my point? He's working on it, he's working towards it, and every day he fights, either you know it or not. That is why it's very important for us to cultivate resistance. Are you, are you understanding me? It's very important that we cultivate resistance as Christians. 
And uh, in the days of the Bible, our fathers were able to maintain the resistance through fellowship as they made. And the Bible said they made on a daily basis. And that helped them. And if you look at the things they went through, things the enemy did to get them back, if they had no spiritual resistance, honestly, they would have given up. If you look at what Paul alone went through, if there was no resistance, we would have given up. So, we want to talk, this issue we're talking about tonight is very, very important because when you hear the Bible talking about a shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, and things like that, where do you think they are? It's not something you hold in your hands. Are you, are you understanding me? Because I know in a bit to help us understand scriptures, we must have watched movies that talk about the shield of faith. The person is holding a sword, sword of the spirit, and he's going to fight. But that thing is not physical. It's not something you hold with your hand. The shield of faith, there's nobody who have come to China and see them with shields. <laughs> so it's not something we hold in our hands. It's not something you, we can even see. Do you understand my point? Those are dimensions of spiritual resistance that you built in your life as a Christian. They are not something you touch. Do you understand me? There are things that must be present in your spirit, present in your soul. Because apart from the warfare that the enemy mounts on each and every one of us because of our salvation, there are other things that make him mount warfare. Maybe your calling. Maybe what God wants to do with your life and stuff like that. Maybe you just being happy. You get my point? You not just having a problem around your life. It can just declare something. So the building of spiritual resistance for a Christian, number one, is to secure your eternal life. Spiritual resistance will help us secure our eternal life. Two, spiritual resistance will help us fulfill our callings. It will help us fulfill our callings. Three, spiritual resistance will help us to do the will of God. It will help us do the will of God. Number one, it will help us secure our calling, our salvation. The Bible says, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Number two, what did I say? It will help us secure our calling. Number three, it will help us do what? The will of God. It's not cheap to do the will of God. If you don't have the resistance, you can't do the will of God. And the, 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 thought, the fourth thing spiritual resistance will help us to do it will help us to work with God it will help us to work with God and number five it will help us to withstand the demonic it will help us to withstand the demonic and number six it will help us to neutralize the flesh. It will help us to do what? It will help us to neutralize the flesh. And number seven, it will help us to demonstrate a dominion over sin. It will help us to demonstrate our God-given dominion over sin. And these things are very, very important. We'll look at them one after the other. It, it will help us demonstrate our God-given dominion. I will have added, it will help us to get and stay married. But, but it's good to add it, even though you are single. I wanted to talk about something that is general. Get and stay married. Spiritual resistance. Hallelujah. Now, as we look at these things, that will guide us on what to pray tonight. Let's, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61 and let's see who the Bible says we are. 
Isaiah chapter 6 to 1. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is a Messianic scripture talking about Jesus and indirectly talking about us also if you have the Spirit of God in your life. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and open up the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort our woman, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of prayer for a spirit of heaviness, that they may be called what? I didn't hear you. So, what did the, what did the Bible say that we are? Hmm? Now, what is the greatest threat of a tree? Number one, the environment. Huh? What's the first threat? That's where that tree is planted. Number two, the quality of the soil. When we say environment, although the soil can also be there, environmental factors like people, people, maybe projects, because when they are executing a project, they can pull down a tree, is that not? And people are, people may need firewood, and the tree is in trouble, is that not? So the soil, if anything happened to the soil, that tree is dead, is that not? Now the next threat of a tree is the weather. So we have storms, rain, and wind. Maybe let's limit ourselves. Okay, okay, we can add this. Another threat of a tree is the, what do we call the animals that come to take residence, that, that come to take shelter in that tree. So let's just say those the tree is sheltering. Huh? This is very, very deep. But I'm not going to talk about it today. Those are the trees a shelter. They can kill it. You get my point? Especially if they are if they are parasites. But look at the the threat of a tree. But let's zero in to maybe the first three. Or maybe we'll talk the four also. Now, if the Bible says we are trees of righteousness. What do you think a tree is supposed to do to survive its threat? The tree must be able to build resistance. Do you understand me? That is all a tree needs to survive. It needs to build resistance. Tell me resistance. Whenever we collapse in the area of spiritual resistance, there is no way that our lives will be, will be good as believers. So, when people come to pull down the tree, it depends on the size of the tree. I remember in my village, when they are pulling down trees, because they are always very big. People have pulled down trees and the tree fell and killed them. So when they are pulling that massive Iroko trees, you have to study where to stand. I remember one day, I followed one of uh, somebody in my village, 1980 something, to pull that tree. So when we went, the man told me to go ahead into the bush. So I was keep going. He started calling it, cutting it down with the machine. When the thing got to a point, the man told me, oh yeah, run to such a place and go and stand. I went. I thought it was okay. He called me. Where are you? I shouted. I am. He said, go far, further again. Because he has seen the height. He knows where it's going to fall. So I went to stand in that place. And he fell the tree. And he fell to the other side. So, 
why did it take him time? Why did he have to use um, the, the machine for cutting the tree? Because his hand cannot pull it down. The tree has sufficient resistance to defile his hands. So you have to engage mechanical means. Now sometimes trees are brought down because of project and things like that. But what really gives this tree the strength or what gives it, it the strength is its capacity to resist anything. Do you understand me? The reason why man can be able to bring down any tree because God gave us dominion over those things. You get my point? But, but a tree must focus on building its capacity, its spiritual resistance against that which comes against it. So if you look at yourself and myself as trees of righteousness, one of our greatest hazards will come from our environment. Is that not? Second hazard will come from the soil we are growing from. What is the soil for us? Grace and truth. Or the earth we are living in, sorry. The earth we are living in is part of the soil. Now, the weather is the activities of the devil, activities of the flesh, activities of the spirit of this world, the gods of this world, the system, and, and, uh, and all of that stuff. And this world, let me not go there. Because you take me from where I want to share. So now, now, I did, I wrote this for us to understand that if we are trees of righteousness, one area we must build our energy is not in our mouth, but in our spiritual capacity to resist. You could be talking, 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 talking. Look at what Peter said to Jesus. Jesus said, eh, before the cock crow, you would deny me three times. Peter swore and said, no. That was a tree there. And Jesus was telling that tree, the weather is going to push you down. And Peter said, no. Why did he say no? I will resist the weather. Are you, are you understanding me? It, Jesus was like saying, maybe the, the, the weather is coming. And Peter said, no. I will not deny you. That's what Peter said. Do you, do you understand me? But, but did Peter deny him? Of course, it's common knowledge. He did it how many times? Not three good times. And if you don't look at it, why will he tell the Lord, I will not? And when the hazard, the threat of a tree hit him, he denied. Because the strength of a tree is not in the mouth. The strength of the tree is in the spirit. I mean the tree of righteousness. Our strength, yes, I believe in faith and confession. You get my point? It's a good thing for us to declare a thing and it shall be established. But our energy is not in what we are saying. The ability to resist these things. Is someone hearing me? The ability to overcome these things is not in our mouth. It's in our capacity. So trees of righteousness should focus on their inside. We should focus on building our internal energy, our capacity on the inside. Because if we don't build it, we forget that we are trees. Do you know that trees don't talk? There's a noise that if you enter massive forest, there's a noise that you hear. It's not a tree that is talking. It's a wind that is blowing. So as it's touching the leaves, you are hearing the sound. Are you understanding me? So, so if we study trees, we will understand how to live our lives. So if a tree, for instance, when the wind is blowing on a tree, it bends it. So if the wind is so strong, it takes the tree down and the tree is resisting the wind. So that's why you see the trees goes like this and they stand like this because they are resisting the wind. And, and some of the things that give them the strength to resist is their root. Is what? Their root. We're talking about cultivating spiritual resistance their root now talking about our roots maybe before we get there 
Let me just write it. Root is the secret of the strength of a tree. Not even the leaves. Not the branches. Is the root. Hallelujah. Is what? Is, is the root. When the enemy want to attack a tree, before the enemy deploy the weather, before he uses the environment, or those inhabiting or being sheltered by the tree, the enemy will go to the root first. Do you understand my point? The enemy will go to the root. The, the first attack base is the root. Now, he knows that if you don't deal with the root, that tree will remain standing no matter the resistance. So, no matter the pressure. So, we'll, we'll come to the root shortly. But what I want you to understand in the back of your mind, you are a tree of righteousness. Are you understanding me? By virtue of salvation, you're a tree of righteousness. In the realm of the spirit, trees are also leaders. Trees are leaders. So maybe we we'll touch that a bit. So you are, the, you are the tree of righteousness. And one of the major things you must focus on as a child of God is your spiritual ability to resist. Are you understanding me? There are three things the Bible says we should resist as trees. Number one, it says resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you understand me? James chapter 4. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, which means if there are demonic activities around our life, our resistance power is poor. If there are demonic activities around our life, our resistance power is poor. Because he said, he did not say scream on the devil, he's going to leave. He said resist. Do you know that sometimes you resist without talking? Huh? So it takes ability for us to resist. So you resist the devil. Number two, you resist the flesh. And number three, you resist the world. Those three things we, we resist. Now, if we don't have the ability to do such things, we are going to lose out in what we have written here. Do you understand me? So number one, how do I secure my salvation? Through spiritual resistance. By now, we know that whatever is found in time hmm? whatever is found within the, the environment of time can be lost do you hear what I'm saying I repeat whatever is found within the environment called time can be lost the only thing that cannot be lost are things found in an environment called eternity you do know why they can be lost there are so many factors one of the factors is Time has the power to bring things to an end. Either good or bad. Eh? So what are you talking about? You mean salvation can be brought to an end? Because I'm living in time? The answer is yes. Do you think that when Judas started following Jesus... He thought that he was going to end the way he ended. No. Okay, let's fast forward. Ananias and Sapphira, when they joined the movement and they became part of the church, did they know that they were going to end that way? No. Why did Paul look at everything and say, so a person has forsaken me, so a person has gone back to the world. They, they found salvation, but they lost it. Everything within time that we find can be lost. This is why when you find a thing, find he who is living beyond time and trust it into his hands. 
so that it will not be lost. Do you know why the Holy Spirit is a major insurance of our salvation? I mean, you are hearing what I'm saying? It's because the Holy Spirit is called the eternal spirit. Do you understand me? He came from eternity into time. So when he lives in us, he can help us secure this not to come to an end. Because you, you can be saved genuinely, thoroughly, and it lasts only for two days. Why? Because time has brought it to an end. So time is so dynamic it, that it can close down things. So the, there are certain uh, standards we have to uphold. So let me, I don't want to call it battle. Certain prizes we have to pay to resist the ability of time to bring good things to an end in our lives for instance the bible says we should not grow weary what does it mean of growing weary the ability to remain agile came to an end huh? you can be very prayerful for only six months so it means after six months it came to an end not because you committed a sin Eh? Are you hear what I'm saying? Not because you committed one sin or do anything. Time just shut it down. Now, how many of you have been in rivers that have strong current? And you are trying to walk up the river. Is there anybody? Eh? Carry your hand up. Now. Let me see. Good. It has a strong current. Maybe it's getting to your waist. And you are trying to walk up the river. Do you see the, the, the force you have to build? You have to hold your legs down and keep pushing. That is how life is. That river is time. We are pushing towards the rigors of time. So that whatever we have does not come to an end. Are you understanding me? Or will not come to an end. So the ability to push is what we are talking about. The spiritual ability. Because salvation can be lost. Time. Look at two things time does to our salvation either to kill it or strengthen it it all depends on how we are standing do you understand me is that, that to do what kill it or what five people can give their life to Christ genuinely ten years down the line three have become worst why two have become massive apostles and prophets shaping the nations why they all had an encounter with the same jesus they all sat under the same teachings or the same discipleship but why is it that these ones became worst after 10 years and the other two became massive men and women of god why because one of the first set time killed whatever they had the other one time strengthened whatever they had so time can either kill your salvation or strengthen it do you understand me growth so me growth growth is a process of time time processing activities that you are involving and give you growth so if you are not involved in any activity time will also process it and give you nothing hmm? are you understanding me? so the question is what do you do every day when you wake up what do you do every day concerning your Christian work do we just limit it to going to church what do we do? What are the activities? Yesterday I was thinking that maybe I have to look for a time to teach the things that every Christian should be doing on a daily basis. Things that if you don't do, we will still call you Christian, but you're a devil. You would depreciate like this and become a beast without knowing. Until when pressure comes on you before the beastly nature comes out. Because there are things we must be doing every day. There was, there was a man I, I used to know in our church, look at church that we grew up. Each time he comes to speak, even though it is a welcome visitor, it was one of the elders. The English that come out of his mouth, I, sometimes I I discover that for even six months he doesn't repeat grammar. So one day I I went to ask him 
What, what is the secret? I went there, I saw him with a massive book in his hands. You know all these novels? Some of you don't understand what I'm saying because you don't read. Even your Bible, you don't read. You know this novel that when you see it, you run. It's very big. He doesn't read little, little books like this. Though. The man reads novels eh, that you can put this Bible into two. The, you know, the short, fat ones that are like blocks. <laughs> so he looked at me and said, look at what I read every day. He told me that he started reading that novel in his hands in 1970. He's, he's, a, he's an old man. 1970, 70 something. Is it 78? That novel. It looks so old. So he now said, as I read every day, I discover new grammar. So I am engaged in a daily activity. I've been doing like this since 1974. That's what he told me, since 1974. Now, somebody has been reading novels from 1974 till 1992. Uh, when I asked the question, he was involved in activity that time processed and give him the capacity to speak out of this world. So when he's speaking, you need a biro. Whatever you do every day, time will carry it and process it and give it to you in a season called harvest. Is somebody hear what I'm saying? So sell me my salvation. Some of you are not talking. Can either be killed or be strengthened by time so it all depends on your spiritual resistance the ability to resist that which kills our salvation when you have it when you when we have that ability we can be we can position our lives in such a way that whatever comes our way does not kill us does not kill our salvation it's rather does what strengthen our salvation so there are things you must be doing every day as a christian so, so in the days to come maybe we'll look at living the christian life maybe we'll just look at it living living the christian life what is the christian life how do we live it how many of you are interested we're going to look at that it's very important that we know what it is we know what should be done on daily basis because that man did that every day of his life and he gave him whatever he was looking for so whatever you are looking for in christ if it is to secure your salvation there are things you must do on daily basis one thing i've realized about salvation is if you are doing nothing about it you will lose it if you are doing something about it you will retain it so let's say we are doing nothing about our salvation time will kill it you won't know when it has died samson did not know when the spirit left him do you understand what I'm saying? And, and in spite of how some of us in the crowd of the spirit, we have had some beautiful teachers. But, but I don't think many of us have come to the point that it has really down on all that Christianity reflects on character. I don't know. Not on charisma. You get my point? I don't know that it, it has down on us that it reflects. It, because when we say char, uh, charisma, we're talking about how you behave under the Holy Spirit. How you believe, behave when the spirit comes upon you and things like that. And uh, some people can even behave when it's not there. But let's just limit ourselves to <laughs> when, when it's there. How you behave. Now, your Christianity is not revealed when the spirit is manifesting in your life. It's revealed after. Do you understand me? After he has. What is it that happened so if, if we understand that we will know that we need to be involved in work so me work on daily basis to to so that time will not kill our salvation but time will do what strengthen it that when you are in christ for five years you become stronger maybe five months five five years ten years by the time you are hitting 15 years in christ you're a giant in the faith are you understanding me I don't know why these days we pride ourselves in becoming fathers of faith, so giants of the faith. The Bible spoke about giants of the faith. You get my point? I'm not talking about fathers. I know no fathers is there. But at least, because you have, you have, the mistake we make is time pass over us. But because we don't get ourselves involved in any spiritual activity, 
time pass over us, deplete us, we become decay, and we begin to take pride in the number of years that has passed over us. And we now use that to describe how mature we are in the Christian, in the Christian faith. No. The old prophet, why did they call him old? A lot of time passed over him. But because he was not involved in activities that would have given him resistance to kill what time would have killed him in his life, he never even knew that the altar of Jeroboam is not of God. He didn't know. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, any day we disconnect from what we ought to be doing on a daily basis, we have positioned ourselves for time to take away good things from us. Don't forget that. Now, we also see calling. Spiritual resistance will help us do what? Fulfill our... When a call of God is genuine, the demons that will be against it will also be genuine. <laughs> do you, do you know what I'm there can be no fake demon around your life. <laughs> If you look at what Paul went through, <laughs> each time I look at his life, <laughs> he's uh, been to wonder how did that man survive? <laughs> do you do you understand me? So so because like what I saw on Sunday, trumpet big for this Sunday or Friday, trumpet be given to people and all of that stuff during the prayer session. Those are trumpets of amazing callings and voices. Because when God speaks through your vocal cords. It's a major threat in the kingdom of darkness. It took me a long time to realize that spirit enabled alterances are more dangerous in the kingdom of darkness than any other thing. Spirit enabled alterances. Now, listen, you could be a very powerful prayer person, prayer will actually transform your life very well but when it comes to shaking the foundations of hell what you say do you understand me what you say when elijah prayed yes it made impact it touched the weather but when elijah spoke (laughs) jezebel becomes crazy why was this about killing the prophet? Because there were voices. The Bible did not say he killed prayer warriors. Do you, do you understand me? Israel, do you see the way the Muslim is, is raised to pray? I mean, if you know that. From childhood, the Muslim is raised to pray five times a day. So Israel, by default, were raised to pray. By default. So even when Jezebel was on duty, they were still praying. In fact, those the prophets who hid themselves, they went to hide to pray. <laughs> that is why we Christians, when it's time to talk, we choose to pray. We are stupid. Sometimes I can't forget when we used to go for evangelism. So then as we were growing up in general, local churches, people some people would tell us that, oh, you, you people should go, we'll be praying for you. No, they don't have the courage to go and preach. So they will say, we should go. Let them pray for us. They don't have the courage. There is power in spirit-led utterance. Either as prophecy or as preaching. Because it is not the prayer. Prayer is very important. But it's not prayer that brings salvation. It's preaching. So prayer can provide the platform for, for, for salvation. But preaching is what pull people out of darkness to light. How can they hear except there's a preacher? Do you understand my point? So prayer is beautiful. I'm not despising it, but I'm showing you the power of utterance. It was when Gideon blew the trumpet that there was a problem. Do you understand me? It was when he blew the trumpet that was a problem. If you look at us here in this nation, when we do our prayers within the church, there's no problem. But let's be on media. Let's speak the word. Let's say we look to ourselves and we pray praying, Jesus is enough in the name of Jesus. Jesus is enough in the name of Jesus. <laughs> there will be no problem. 
Father, we declare you are enough. You are enough over my life and my family. In the name of Jesus. Jesus is enough over my shoes. Enough over my everything about me. He's enough for my children as they go to school. He's enough. We declare he's enough and we're going to have provisions. Amen. You don't have a problem. But come out and declare. Jesus is enough. That alone. That is why we pray that God anoint everybody. And you begin to operate the realm of spirit enabled utterance. Even when the enemy surrounds you like a flood, if only you can come to the realm of spirit enabled utterance and say a thing, you push him back. Do you understand me? You push him back. So the call of God, not, not just the call to be a Christian, the call to either declare, the call to be a preacher, the call to do the work of the Lord, it can be fought terribly if it is genuine in fact in the kingdom of in the realm of warfare fake callings are not fought fake callings are not fought if, if you see the devil fighting a fake calling it's to keep the person fake if you see satan fighting a fake calling it's to do what it's to keep you fake if you see the devil fighting an imposter it's to keep the person as an imposter but the ones he heap and he gives decrees to her to dismantle are those that have the sign of divine approval. So as a result, it takes spiritual resistance to fulfill a calling. If you don't have the resistance against the hazard of a divine call, you can't fulfill it. Do you understand my point? If you don't have the resistance against the hazards of a divine call you cannot fulfill it so you can see how spiritual resistance helps us to fulfill our calling and do you know that even the courage to step into a calling you need that spiritual resistance against fear you need to resist fear you need to resist those who don't believe in you you need to resist those who, who don't who don't trust that you have a calling. Is somebody hearing me? You have to resist all those things to step into it. Even when there are evidence all around that yes, you have a call upon your life, there will still be those who don't believe. Even Jesus, not everybody believed in him. So, and look at the mistake we make. And it, it is not natural, if you are in the realm of the natural, it's natural for every one of us, that, that, 200 people could believe in you. The 20 who did not would take your attention. <laughs> How many of you realize that? The 20 who don't, are the one that would take your attention. So you'll be seeking to prove to the 20. Why there are 200 waiting for you? Do you understand me? Why there are 200 waiting for you? Do, do you know that the devil understands that tendency? in us as humans so what he do he does he will pick very few people and give them very loud noise because whatever is genuine does not make noise so the genuine followers will not make noise the genuine guys who are benefiting and enjoying whatever will not uh, be, be because they are silent you would think they are not there so, but you have to build a resistance against the distraction of every call. Every calling has a distraction attached. Every calling will have a distraction, a distraction attached. When Moses was going to Egypt to bring Israel out, what was the distraction that came? The uncircumcised child. And it led to marital crisis between him and his wife. And he had to tell the woman to carry the boy back home distraction and the Bible, the Bible said God made Moses to kill him because Moses did not implement the covenant that he has with Abraham when God want to cover every part of your life with the covenant he will chastise you when you don't keep it how do you know that God ratify a covenant with you when he chastises you when you break it when you say you have a covenant with God and you break it and God don't chastise you you don't have do you understand me it does not exist you are just talking but when there's a covenant between you and God and you break it, God will chastise you. So Moses broke the covenant and God made him to chastise him. And that was a major distraction because when it comes to matters of calling, there are distractions that are sent. There are things that come in around to make sure that it's not fulfilled. So you must build a resistance against it. Some of you are me. Doing the will of God also has a lot of resistance. 
But when we have that spiritual capacity to resist, for instance, the widow of Zarephath, what was the will of God for her at that time? It was for her to take care of Elijah. You get my point? And she was moving to take up herself and her son. And behold, a stranger showed up. And Esther has studied that conversation. It seems to me, it's either she must have been a woman that have heard about Elijah before or something, or maybe she has not seen him before because I'm just amazed. Somebody meets you and tells you, give me water to drink. As I'm going to take it, you came back and the person is telling you, um, bring food. You now said no. And in fact, we're not even supposed to respond if you don't know him. You get my point. Maybe, maybe she was also a very good person that loved taking care of strangers. By that time, everything finished. But what was the will of God for her? As of that time, God's will for her was for her to forget about herself. Write this down, forget about myself. And I will say something about that. Why do we need to build resistance to have spiritual resistance to be able to do God's will? It's because doing God's will involves selflessness. No selfish person can do the will of God. Is someone hearing me? No selfish person can do the will of God. The will of God is for the selfless. It's not for the self-centered. Because if you are selfish, you can't do it. There's nothing about the will of God that is self-centered. That's why it's not cheap. That's why it's painful. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So the woman have to build a resistance against selfishness. So to do the will of God, we must build resistance against what? I didn't hear you. We must build resistance against... Let me run through seven things to build resistance against, to do God's will. Seven areas that spiritual resistance is going to help us to do God's will. Number one, it will help us in the area of selfishness. When we have that resist that spiritual resistance, we will be able to beat selfishness. Is someone hearing me? We'll be able to beat self-centeredness. We will not be self-centered. Not that you will not be tempted to be. But because you have the resistance against self-centeredness, people will look at you and say, this person is sacrificial. Everybody has the ability to be selfish. There's nobody that doesn't have. Is somebody hearing me? From childhood, a child, from childhood, you, you know how selfish some children are? You will give them something. You are the one that gave them. For them to even give you a little. If you want to teach your child how to be generous, give them what they love best. Let me say bread. Give them a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, and you tell them to give you a part from it to eat and see what will happen. You get my point? So teach them how to be generous by forcing them to give you a part. Yes, you have. So, 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 so if, if you look at it, everybody is born, is born selfish. Everybody has it. But some have the resistance against it. So once you have resistance against selfishness, you become sacrificial. That means, do you know that everything within us comes from the realm of thought? Hmm? So, you, you, want to, you want to do the will of God and a thought will now come in and say, don't, like, like that woman. When Elijah told her, give me this, a thought came in which she voiced out. She said, I don't have anything in this house for a phrase except a muzzle of this and a, a little jar in the oil. And I'm going to prepare this thing so that we eat and die. She was responding based on what came. But when Elijah spoke, she, be, she used his words to build resistance against that self-centeredness. Do you, do you understand me? To resist it and say, no, this is not time to be self-centered. The thought came. She told, she told the thought, no. She brought it under subjection. All of us have the ability to say no when God says yes. But the resistance to put that ability down is what keeps us saying yes when God says yes. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? The same thing we can see in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was about dying. And what did he say? He said, Lord, let this cup pass me. In another word, 
He wanted to be selfish for a moment. But what did he say? Not my will. In another word, I refuse to be selfish. Nobody can do the will of God when you are self-centered. Any will of God you can do in self-centeredness is your own will. Check it very well. It's your will. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying here? So spiritual resistance for a child of God helps him or her to do the will of God. If you look at David and Saul, the, it, it's like the same challenges they faced. It's like the same thing. Saul was given instructions of what to do. And he broke all. Why? Self-centeredness. David was also giving his own instructions. And he kept all. Selflessness. Do you understand me? So, spiritual resistance to do, that will enable us to do the will of God, will help us not to be so, how many things have I given you? What did I say I'm giving you? Let me see if you are following. Sorry? No. There's something I say I'm giving you, which is number one. Sorry? The areas that spiritual resistance will help you deal with so that you can do the will of God. Is that not what we are saying? And the first thing to help you do what? Conquer self-centeredness. The second thing that spiritual, will help, spiritual resistance will help you do to do the will of God, it will help you arrest human interference. There is human interference. If you, it, to, to, to help us arrest human interference. Number three, it will help us go against the culture. Sometimes culture interference comes in. It may not be human. It could be demonic. It could be established lifestyle. And the fourth thing that that spiritual resistance area, it gives us victory to, to, for us to be able to do the will of God is it to enable us to have a spirit that is alert and ready. A spirit that is what? Alert and ready. If your spirit is not alert, you can't do the will of God. Like I, I said one of those days, the sons of the prophet that did not follow Elijah, they were supposed to also follow. Is that not? When it was time for Elijah, for Elijah to be taken. Because they, they have all been schooled in the same school. They were all supposed to follow. They were not alert. They were not alert in the spirit. So number five, the fifth thing you overcome in order to be able to do what the will of God is, you must overcome ignorance. And this is where people who want to do the will of God must be looking for knowledge. They must be feeding their spirit with knowledge. You cannot do the will of God if you are ignorant about that will. Is someone hearing me? You cannot do the will of God if you are, if you are ignorant. And number 16, that you have to that the, the resistance will help us to overcome it will help us to overcome what we are used to sometimes your senses your natural senses what it tells you what the senses have been become used to so you, when your sense become used to a particular thing you cannot follow god in fresh dimensions do you understand my point things that you are not used to you resist them because there are people that they are not used to something they fight against it you're not used to something, so of you to sit down and study it. You fight against it. Do you understand me? Because the will of God will always come through pathways that you're not familiar with. And because you're not familiar with this thing, naturally, people, some people just build a resistance. Others just build a fight, a contention against it. We're not familiar with this thing. When Jesus came, he brought in things that the Pharisees were not familiar with. And instead of them to sit down and study they began to put on a fight. When he stood and said, I am the way, uh -uh, it was confusing. When he stood and said, before Abraham was, I was, uh -uh. what was the meaning of this? We, look, the first thing I said, we just saw when you were born just yesterday. And now you are saying before Abraham, you hear. What kind of a speech is that? In fact, they killed Jesus because they never understood him. Whenever something that is new to you show up, sit down and study it. 
you understand my point? Sit down and do what? Study it. Do you know that before you see me coming out speaking against oil, water, and some of these things, I have studied it for years. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because all the people who brought it claimed that God told them. We didn't doubt. We said, okay, it's true God told you. So, but let's sit down and look at scriptures. Let's sit down and look at scriptures. Yes, God told you, but let's sit down and look at scriptures. When something is new to you, sit down and study it first. It is after you have studied. Study is you beaming the touch light on it. Are you understanding me? The touch light of knowledge on it so that you discover the, everything about it. So the, the seventh thing that, that will help us do the will of God an area that when we have this spiritual resistance within us, it will help us to do the will of God. It will help us to overcome carnal mindedness. This is close to what I said earlier, but it's not best far. Carnal, you see, you cannot do the will of God in carnality. To be carnally minded is what? Is dead. Those are just the few things I want to mention. So, spiritual resistance help us to secure our salvation, help us to fulfill our calling, help us to do the will of God. Are you understanding me? And, and sometimes to do the will of God requires a lot of patience, endurance. Is somebody hearing me? So, now, it also helps us to walk with God. God is not visible. We don't see him. We only sense him. Do you understand my point? Nobody has ever entered God's office and sit down in the chair. If you find it, let us know. <laughs> do you understand me? But he is real. He is more real than you and I. Because he's invisible, many people don't believe he exists. So, to work with this invisible God, you need to fight the things that come to convince you so many things about him that are not true. For instance, God does not care. No, he does. Oh, God does not love me. Oh, don't try that. The Bible says he's love. Do you understand me? You build resistance against contrary thoughts. Contrary thoughts. Resistance against contrary opinions. Sometimes your circumstances try to preach to you. Sometimes a prayer you have been praying that is being delayed in answer try to speak to you. So that is when you build resistance against those things that are coming to frustrate your work with God. Do you know that in the natural realm, in the natural realm, in the place of competition, marital competition, among ladies, for example, and let's say they are just in a group of seven friends, ladies, seven of them, and why they are all there, you know, they, they are eyeing this person or the other person, maybe the person they are eyeing came to pick just one, and the other remaining six have the option to either team up and support their friend to get and stay married, or fight. So let's assume they choose to fight. Let's assume out of the seven, the, out of the six that remain, four decide to support, two decide to fight. So how do you think they will fight? Because one, they are not witches or wizards. How do you think they will fight? They will fight that lady's work with who she wants to marry. Is that not? They will fight her work with him. How do, will they fight their, her work with him? Of course, we know it's true misinformation or disinformation. That's the way the devil fight our work with God. Do you understand my point? True misinformation or disinformation. Now, now he comes in to tell all things about God. You see, we can all be in church and shouting hallelujah and say praise the Lord. But when you go back home, where there's no pulpit, there's no keyboard, there's no church environment, you are there with your circumstances. How many of you can relate with what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you are there with your circumstances. You are there with your situation. That's why he comes to speak. He will not speak in church. He knows you are busy dancing. Or busy listening. Or busy writing. Nothing. He will say nothing to you. But when you now get back home to your closet, he comes. 
If you don't have the resistance to work with God, there are seven things you do to him. Number one, you doubt him. One, you doubt him. Two, you argue with him. One, you doubt him. Two, you argue with him. Three, you deny him. Four, you disobey him. Five, you rebel against him. If you don't have the resistance to work with God, the ability to resist all these things that comes our way. Six, you can connive against God. <laughs> hey, by finding friends of like passions. We, we are tired of going to church. Uh, even me, I was tired yesterday. Come, how are you? You now became friend. Can I have your phone number? You enter the WhatsApp group. <laughs> you have connived against God. <laughs> it's a God. It's a wicked conspiracy. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Just because the person has no resistance to work with God. Nobody works with God in a wicked world without being fought. You must resist what is fighting you. And the seventh of the many things we can do to God when we lose the resistance to work with him is to begin to speak for either the flesh, the devil, or the world. We begin to speak for those three enemies. We speak for the flesh. We speak for the devil or we speak for the world. How do you speak for the flesh? We are all sinners. You are speaking for the flesh. Nobody is perfect. You are speaking for the flesh. Do you hear my point? So there are statements we make to speak for the flesh. Do you know that Cain spoke for the flesh? He spoke for the spirit of, of, uh, how do we call it? The fitness of the flesh. He spoke for it. When God said there is sin at your door. After he has killed Abel. Where is now Abel your brother? When you give excuses for sins you have committed, you are speaking for the flesh. Or you give excuses for you not praying. Why is it you not praying? Well, I'm living in zinc. You are speaking for the flesh. People are living on trees and they are praying. In fact, people are walking on food and they are praying. Why are you not praying? I slept late. Oh, I slept early. Why are you not fasting? Each time I try, I just, I begin to feel somehow. You are speaking for the flesh. Why didn't you come to church? I woke up in the morning and I wanted to start coming. I just have a feeling that I should not come today. I've chosen to be on. I, I, I followed online. You are speaking for the flesh. Whenever we don't have the resistance to work with God, we speak for the flesh. We accommodate the laxities of our flesh. We accommodate them. We don't resist the flesh. We don't fight the flesh. They know you are an enemy. Our, if our sinful habit will begin to give excuses for them. Is someone hearing me? We begin to excuse ourselves for our sinful habit. They will ask you, why, why are you so hateful and bitter? You know, so the Bible says, Isaiah's mouth was have iniquity because he lived among the people of uncleanness. He's all disciplined in this compound. They will not let me rest. <laughs> you cannot live with them without, you know, we are speaking for the flesh. Why? Because the strength to work with God is what? Reducing. The, the ability to resist that which comes to frustrate us is, is going down. When we have number five, when we have ability, spiritual resistance, we are able to overcome what? What did I say? Should write number five? Overcome what? The demonic. It takes spiritual resistance to neutralize the demonic. Hallelujah. I've given you so many things tonight. 
I hope you are not confused. Eh? Eh? I hope you are following your notes properly. We are back to number five. You remember? Uh -huh. So, and we have said that if there are persistent demonic activities around our lives, it's because our resistance level is poor. Do you understand me? It's because what? Our resistance level is poor. There is a constant incursion of darkness to our lives. Thank God we are enjoying peace. You get my point? But that does not mean the devil is not launching attack. That does not mean he's not launching attack. Do you understand me? One of the major ways the enemy attacked the saints is like what happened in Israel. That is on the news everywhere. They said the people infiltrated infiltrated for a long time and carried whatever they carried so that's what happened to us christians you are there people infiltrate your life pretending to be born again as a pastor people infiltrate the church pretending to be christians and they can stay for 10 years infiltration but when we have the spiritual resistance you get my point we will be able to neutralize the demonic. Sometimes it could, it could shake you, but it cannot bury you. Do you understand me? It could do what? Shake you, but it cannot bury you. Look at Job, for example. His own case was not infiltration at all because God just told him. And the enemy launched all kinds of assault on him. But his resistance, that means in the midst of demonic attacks, how do I unleash that spiritual resistance in the midst of demonic attack? I should focus on making sure that my faith in God does not fail. You hear my point? I should focus what? Making sure what? My faith in God. What did God, Jesus say about Peter? He said, I have prayed for you that your faith what? No matter what the devil is doing to you, my brother, my sister, if your faith is still intact, you are coming out. You may lose your job, you may lose your health, like Job, you may lose everything. If your faith in God has not been lost, your recovery is not in doubt. So me, if my faith in God have not been lost, my recovery is not in doubt. The whole world, the whole prophets, the whole pastors may gather and prophesy against you, just make sure your faith is intact. The whole demons may come against you. Make sure your faith is intact. Is someone hearing me? Everybody will be shouting right loud and saying, oh, you are this, you are this. Make sure you Can you imagine sometimes, begin to think, how Samson survived where he was tied. You remember? Not Delilah's house. The consequence of his decision. When he entered where the nun chained him. Remove his eyes. And they put him to perform. If you go and read that place, you know, sometimes when we read these things, we don't know how to play them into reality. If you don't use your mind and play those scriptures into reality, you won't know what those guys, you won't know what is divine intervention. You get my point? So, so I played that thing. I said to myself, somebody's eyes are removed. And it was chained. And the Bible says there was noise all around. It was like a stadium. You get my point? And there was noise. And the people were even on the roof. You see, may God not allow the devil around us like that. Too, because it's not easy. People were even on the roof. So it means there is no space to hear any other voice. All from the top. The noise was coming above. This way, from the ground, because he was on the high place. So guys were on ground, guys were up, guys were everywhere, and they were shouting praises to Dagon. 
So look at the noise alone that was coming. The only thing Sapphire was hearing was Dagon. Dagon. They were worshiping Dagon and they were shouting. So he, he could, there was no Jew around to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Do you know that for us believers, those beautiful things can help us in the midst of adversity? There was no way to stand beside Samson and say, The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. Oh, this one I am going to. Nobody's encouraging me. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Don't, don't be a lazy Christian. You, you get my point. <laughs> don't be a lazy Christian looking for somebody to encourage you. The days are gone. Tell you know what the days are gone. God even gave you a wrong pastor. <laughs> he didn't even send me a text to encourage me. Have I encouraged myself? Before I'm not encouraging you. <laughs> let's all encourage. Let's trust God to encourage us. <laughs> you get my point. Let him encourage us in different ways. <laughs> because we are all fighting this battle. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Thank God the cross spirit. There are, no, there are no babies with pampas. That's the kind of church we have. You, you, that's why God bless us in this place. We don't have members who are babies with pampas. Waiting for me to call them before they come to church. They don't exist. But they never come. He, because they will make me to just go and sleep on Sunday morning. May they, may they never come. Because we are being prepared to be an army that will be launched into the battlefield. Babies are not launched into battle. Have you ever seen a baby? Go and watch what's happening in Israel right now. Do you see babies coming out like this? Papa, papa. No. It's people who have passed through the seasons of life. They have seen adversity and developed their muscles. The Bible called them a people made ready for the Lord. Hallelujah. Made ready for the Lord. That is who we are. A people what? Made ready for the Lord. Made ready. Made ready. So if we don't have this resistance against the demonic, if we don't build it, it will just overwhelm us. Something was just there. Shout all over. His mother, shoo. Israel, shoo. People he was fighting for, they were not there. He alone. Each time I play that, he alone. This was shout. Okay, let's assume they were shouting accusations. They have accusations here. Do you know that accusation can kill you more than a bullet? Accusations, especially when they are false. When they are true, no problem. You can't even be dancing while they are accusing you. Because they are talking the truth. But if they are false, you feel like dying. Because a false accusation describes who you are not. And it takes a lot of dying to overcome such assault. So Samson was being thrown here. They were being, so there was no voice coming from anywhere to encourage him. I, I'm telling you why Samson ended in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call in the Pentecostal cycle, we call it God's hall of faith. That's what we call it. How did he end there? Because in the midst of that noise all over, he was able to connect God. He was able to connect God. He was able to disconnect from all the noise and connect God that is resistance that is spiritual resistance it helped him to neutralize that demonic atmosphere around him may God grant us such that amen is too weak may God grant you spiritual resistance against the voices of evil and nonsense around your life in the name of Jesus do you know that Samson bent his spirit in God. He never even knew that there will, you know, the hair has grown back and uh, the, fact, the Bible says it began to grow. So not that it grew and got to the way it was before. And he now told the little boy, please, put my hands in the pillar. Why they are shouting, it is connect. Listen, when we are in the midst of battle, if we don't disconnect from what the enemy is saying, we cannot enter into what God has done. God has declared a year of impact. He has already done it. God does not declare before it. I mean, God does not declare what he has not done. You get my point? He says our year of impact. So, but one thing we should do, we should remove our ears. 
Some of you, you have different noises around your life. It could be the noise of family, the noise of friends, the noise of what, wherever you live, the noise of your circumstances. Just shouting the way they shouted on Samson. Is somebody hearing me? And he was able to disconnect from the environment, disconnect from the noises. In fact, Samson did not stand and begin to respond. Samson did not look at, what are you saying? No, he was, he focuses his mind in, how do I stop? stop this how do i pull down how do i neutralize this in the midst of any demonic attack focus on neutralizing the attack do you understand me build just fix your heart in the christ in you the spirit of god within your life connect him through prayer so when we have that spiritual resistance we can neutralize the demonic number six we say we can neutralize the flesh also one of the most powerful force on earth is the force of the flesh many of us have not realized that the force of the flesh is stronger than the force of the devil you know why because the devil has been defeated there's no place in the bible that said the flesh had been defeated jesus took the devil and nailed him is that not the bible says he stripped him hebrew chapter 2 says what he destroyed him is that not some of you have okay let's go to hebrew chapter 2 hebrew chapter 2 verse 14 Can we read it? Okay, we are not there yet. Some of you are not there yet. Hebrew 2 14. In as much then as what? As the children are partaking of flesh and blood, he himself likewise did what? Share in the same. That through death he might, he might do what? Destroy him who had the power of death. That is what? The devil. So stay with me, Jesus by dying on the cross destroyed the power of the devil so the, the power of the devil has been destroyed his death on the cross destroyed it but the flesh Jesus did not destroy the flesh on the cross <laughs> you understand he did not he destroyed the enemy the power of the devil is stronger than is weaker than the power of the flesh you can write it down the power of the devil is weaker than the power of the flesh that is why when the devil wants to fight there's a kind of demonic satanic attack where he blew air into your flesh <laughs> you know when a Christian have gone through the dying process of crucifying the flesh, when the flesh, I wish I have a balloon to demonstrate this, when the flesh has been crucified, it's like a balloon without air. It's dead. But is the balloon absent? No, it's dead. That's why you can never, the Bible says, let it have think it is time. Take it. So, because you cannot be you cannot bury the flesh until you have left the world. So, but you can crucify it. So, when it's crucified, what happened? The balloon is dead. When you are in a season of intense fasting, prayer, all of that stuff, the balloon have no air. It's dead. So, when the, when the flesh is dead like that, you don't fall into temptation. Is that what you're hearing me? That was why Jesus was able to overcome temptation. You don't fall into temptation when the flesh is dead like that so but set, look at what the devil does in certain warfare he comes to blow the balloon and give it energy so that the flesh can sway you that's how he behaves but once now what when we now have the resistance the air the enemy is trying to put in the balloon will not enter because we have a resistance against his influence is someone hearing me? So the resistance against the flesh 
is what helps us not to follow the passions of the flesh. So, but if we don't have the resistance, we follow the passions of the flesh. That is where things like the book of Romans, that the Bible says, things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them, is because you have not received the resistance not to do them. Is someone hearing me? I just say helping you. So, whenever you are doing what you don't want to do, it's because there's no resistance not to do it. That's why statement like, I find myself. Some people are speaking the truth, some are lying when they say, I find myself. But, but, but I'm talking about, in order not to find yourself, find the resistance. That's how the issue of resistance is very important. How to build spiritual resistance, very, very important. So, when we have it, we can disobey the demands of the flesh. But when we don't have that resistance, we obey. And look at what God does. There are people who follow the flesh because they don't have the resistance not to follow. The Bible called them weak. Not wicked. Weak. But those who have the resistance and ignore are called wicked. Is it possible to have the resistance and ignore uh, ignore and still follow the flesh? Let, let's look at one guy in the Bible. Cain was told by God, there is sin at your door. Is that not? He was warned and he still went on. Now, you looking at me today, we here in this hall, are there seasons in our lives that we, can, we know? We have the ability to say no, but we just said yes. You get my point? That time you rebelled. That time you were wicked. You were not weak. Is someone hearing me? Jesus rebukes the wicked and gives strength to the weak. That is why you see two people who commit one sin. One will be told, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. The other one will be told, sit down here, let me give you some knocks. <laughs> Why? One had the resistor, but refused to use it. The other one does not have, and God came to strengthen the person. There is nothing about the Christian faith that is possible without spiritual resistance. That is why when we come into Christ, it gives us a reason. So when we have the reason, we're able, we're able to resist the flesh. Now, if you look at Paul, one thing about the resistance that helps us to overcome the flesh, you must build it every day. You don't survive tomorrow by today's resistance. When it comes to dealing with the flesh. Is somebody hearing me? Because it is stronger than the devil. The blood of Jesus can deal with any demon, but it cannot deal with the flesh. So when the flesh is staring you and you say blood of Jesus, mm, forget it. <laughs> you are just wasting your time. <laughs> are you understanding me? You are just, I just wasting your time. There is no spiritual weapon for arresting the flesh. All spiritual weapons are to deal with the devil <laughs> and his agents. When it comes to the flesh, crucifixion, it's not a, just a weapon, it's a process. Are you understanding me? The ability to crucify is the spiritual resistance that neutralizes the flesh. The ability to crucify. Our will must be empowered by the Spirit of God not to bend or not to bow to the demands of the flesh. Is someone hearing me? Now, resistance against sin. Number six, they all work together. Six and seven, sorry. Number seven, six and seven work together. So, the Bible says in Hebrew chapter seven, I think, we have not, is this chapter seven or chapter four? Okay, maybe seven. That says we have not yet resisted to blood striving against sin. Wherever you find it, because I've not, time is going yet, I've not spoken about what I wanted to say. You get my point? Remember all these things to lay foundation, remember? <laughs> we wanted to look at how to build, is that not? And I say it is root, is that not? 
Uh-huh. So, but don't worry, we'll finish it quite early, then we pray. Now, now, getting and staying married also requires spiritual resistance. You get my point? Because for those who are married, they must understand me. The first two, three years of marriage, you survive on emotions. That means it is what you feel about yourselves that keeps you together. But from four years, you survive by reasoning. Wisdom now comes in. The first three years for some people, some people, it's not even three days, it's three months. <laughs> and there was something I read today. Uh, was it today or yesterday? The, the woman said, they, you know, they're not born again anyway. So, he said, they, they were in courtship for 10 years. They now got married. And the marriage lasted for one year. <laughs> you know, we live in a crazy world. These are the things that I know that the end is very close. Now, <laughs> courtship lasted longer <laughs> than marriage. <laughs> you begin to wonder, why do you just import the principles of of course, she beat on the marriage. <laughs> I, are you understanding? You're supposed to just, okay, what is it that kept the courtship so long? Let's bring it. Okay, let's bring it into the marriage. Or we just call the marriage courtship. Let's forget about it. Maybe it's the word marriage that killed it. <laughs> because these are unbelievers that were living together. They lived together for 10 years and now say, let's marry. So after marriage, the thing now died. So you're supposed to, you're supposed to mention the word marriage. <laughs> So, so, such a funny thing. But we live in a season where the pressure of life, you get my point? The end time pressure, a whole lot of things. Things have changed so much. There's a lot of dynamics that interplay into matters of relationship. So, if there is no spiritual resistance in the heart of the believers who are involved in their relationship, they will just crash everything. So you have to build resistance. We just finished a marriage conference. So I, I wanted to give you seven things to build resistance against. But let's leave it. You know, the, you are, are you not still chewing the marriage? The what to marry? Well, you, when you get married, it is what to marry. Is that not what we say? And so I think that is enough for now. Let's leave the one of the seven kind of resistance you have to build. Now, let's go into... How do I now build the, the, the spiritual resistance? Sorry, the, the seven kinds of things that you have to build resistance against in marriage. How do I, how do I build the spiritual resistance now to be able to secure my salvation, my calling, my will, I mean the will of God, or sorry, do the will of God, work with God, neutralize the demonic, put the flesh under subjection, uh, have dominion over sin, get and stay married in case... So, so how do I build that? And we have said, let's go back to what we began with. We say we are trees. Is that not? Hello? We say we are trees. Now, as trees of righteousness, the strength of every tree is the root. Amen. Is what? The root. You know, children who are seen afar of may think that this sin has root. It does not. It only has a base. There are Christians that are like this. You get my point? If not for principle of decoration, I will have used this to analyze something very important. I think I can use it. Nancy, sure I can use this. Uh-huh. There are Christians. I know somebody will even be shocked watching from home. I thought that was a tree. That is how some of us, our Christianity is. We are like this. Somebody comes, wow, this is some Christian. He have the strength. If the person is praying, speaking in tongues, or preaching, involved in church activities, have some gift of the spirit. Hmm. God, gift of the spirit. Have some of this stuff. But when the wind just comes, not even I'm not even a wind. You know, you see the way I carried it. But if these things have root, despite how small it is, I can't just I can't just carry it like this. You see the way I'm carrying it without many hands. Because it has no root. 
it is possible to be this Christian. To be this tree of righteousness. So when Peter was saying, Father, I'm going to, I'm not going to deny you, I'm not going to deny you. Jesus said, hey, son of man, you are ruthless. Because <laughs> one little wind that will come out of the mouth of a little girl, a slave girl, not even a king. A slave. That wind will make you say you don't know me. It will make you carry like move like this. It will move you like this. But I have prayed that after you have been moved like this, God should hold you and be your root. He should hold you. Then after he has held you and none dug you into the soil of his word, the soil of his will and his spirit, you will now become converted. Write the word conversion down. You become converted. Then when you have converted, strengthen. In another word, help others to develop their own root. And that's what I'm doing as a pastor. You are not to survive on my root. Rather, of course, there's a way you survive on my root anyway. Because there's no, because a tree, you survive on my root. Some of you, in fact, not some, everybody. Now, listen carefully. That is for the leader. So now, conversion. Why did I say you should write the word conversion down? Because one of the signs that you have root in Christ is conversion. This is where the issue of character now comes in. Are you a Christian? Yes. Is it by mouth or by practice? I don't know. Are you born again? Yes. Is it by fruit or by faith without fruit? You see, conversion is it's a major symbol that you have root in Christ. Because it is true conversion that the old life is buried. That's what the Bible says. Repent and be converted so that times of refreshing will come. How do you know that you have root? Are you converted? That is how you know. What does it mean to be converted? Let me just say certain things. There are people who go into nations and by virtue of staying there for long, they become citizens like Africans in America. But the acquisition of the document Called international passport does not touch your DNA. <laughs> you are still an African by blood. I am having fear for America. I don't know what will happen to that country in the next 50 years. People are prophesying a whole lot of things because they are absorbing a lot of foreigners. Even those who hate them are being given green card. In the next 50 years, you may not see any American indigenous in that country holding any sensitive position. They have allowed foreign, foreign people to enter their military, enter every sensitive part. They have allowed guys who hate J E S U S to be everywhere, even their parliament. Because they thought that by becoming an American through document makes you an American by blood. No. Is someone hearing me? I'm going somewhere. I'm using that to teach you something. Now, conversion, sorry, Christianity without conversion is like having an American passport and you are called officially an American. But by genetic checkup, you are not an American. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That is how we have reduced salvation. Is someone hearing me? That's how we have reduced these things. Conversion is a DNA thing. It's a spirit thing. Is someone hearing me? It's like being moved from being a monkey to a human being. Being moved from being 
this to that through the creation of a new spirit that's why in the light of that we're not supposed to be i know i say i'm going to teach you how a christian is supposed to be but in the light of that we're not supposed to behave like christians we're supposed to be christians you know that's what i'm saying we're not supposed to behave like we're supposed to be so when a man is behaving like a woman you know there's a problem there and when a woman behaves like a man there's a problem so if you're a woman be a woman you get my point if you're a man be a man that's how it is so in when we are converted there's a change within so that tells me one of the major sign that you have root as a tree reflect on your lifestyle are we are we here are you understanding me it reflects where your spirit nature your lifestyle what you do under pressure who you are instead of behaving like trees without root you know and yet we look so beautiful they can use it for decoration but there's no root if we don't have root we can be moved by the devil he moves you here moves you there moves you there he shakes you like this and all of that stuff because you have no root but when you have root you cannot be relocated you are right where god planted you is somebody hearing me how many of you understand me tonight you are right where god planted you. people who have root they cannot be moved permanently by the devil from being born again to being an inner thing from being men and women of truth to men and women of lies so so if you are a christian who's whose moral nature or character is not reformed then you're a christian without root is someone, is someone hearing me there's no root there's no root now how do i develop this spiritual root Be- because they help me to resist how do we develop them one knowledge spiritual roots are developed from the place of knowledge you must know my people are destroyed for not knowing you must know Isaiah chapter 5 let me show you something you must know if you don't know you cannot have spiritual root so this is where discipleship teaching comes in you must know Isaiah chapter 5 there's a scripture I'm looking for verse 13 therefore my people have gone into captivity do you see it that means the trees have been uprooted have been relocated somebody can come here and steal this is that not and just go with it but let's say this thing is rooted you can't just enter and steal it is that what you're hearing me because you need it alive so you're not going to uproot it when you put it it's dead is that what you're hearing me so so why is it that the enemy can sift us like wheat because we have no root you just came back from church and you meet somebody who is gossiping and talking nonsense and you participated in it before you now realize that you came back from church it's too late you don't have root people who have root have principles have what They are principled men and women. The Bible said, therefore, my people have gone into captivity. They were, they were relocated because they have no knowledge. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13. So, if you want to develop spiritual root, please be exposed to knowledge. The knowledge of Christ. Spiritual knowledge will help you develop spiritual root. Very important. Spiritual knowledge. Bible knowledge. The spiritual knowledge we have as believers... It's not the one in occult books. They are also spiritual knowledge. It's not the one in uh, shrines of witch doctors. It's the knowledge of God. Is what? In occultism, they study spiritual knowledge. 
they know things to engage and they get things done. Are you understanding me? Something happened to somebody I know years back. She was just growing very beautiful. She was, I think, my, I think, do they call it cousin? You know, this English language, eh? Is the daughter of my, of my, um, of my, no, <laughs> my, my, my grand, my, <laughs> leave me alone. So, <laughs> she's a woman. <laughs> So, we were all grew up there in Abuja, young teenagers. She was one of the most beautiful far relatives I had. Very beautiful girl. So, we were all growing up together, related. Um, so, they moved from Abuja to another part of Nigeria. So, we were in communication. And when they got there, no, not saved anyway. And there was this man in their neighbor that was pushing her for relationship and an old man <coughs> at the guess what nonsense is this he started insulting him and um, the man was into spiritism he now have spiritual books he took the book he told the girl that sorry even i think the thing even got to, yeah the girl said he told the girl by next week you'll be the one to move to my house the girl said stupid man old man hey, hey, hey. the man's okay so the man will open this spiritual book and come out. That's how this one they tell you to pray in the night. I know they are teaching you witchcraft. He will come around 12 midnight and recite things from the spiritual book incantation. He did it only three days. The innocent girl moved into his house. With, she woke up one morning and began to fight her mother and her father. He said, what's happening to you? She just carried her back and went to the man's house. You know, they are all not safe. And the mother looked at it and said, Oh, you, you old man, you want to kill my daughter? I, want to, I will show you where I came from. And she traveled to the village. <laughs> <laughs> she went there and did her own. Before she came back, the girl had come back home. <laughs> Satan has power. Don't joke. You better bury yourself in Christ. Are you, are you, are you understanding me? So I need a, you need to understand that. So when I say spiritual knowledge, I'm not referring to the one from occult dark worlds. Some of them we have them in church. I'm talking about the knowledge of God. Once you have the knowledge of God, your root formation process has begun. Because you cannot form a root you don't know. You cannot grow a root you don't know. Is someone hearing me? So so once you have the knowledge of God. Number two, how do you develop your roots? Application of what you know. Application of what you know over time. When I apply what I know over time, it becomes a root in me. For instance, the knowledge of truth. When you apply the knowledge of truth over time, you develop spiritual roots in Christ. So what is killing many of us is lack of application. Is someone hearing me? You can't grow root without applying. And here is one thing that not, none of us can check our application principles. None of us can check. And none of us can even know whether we have roots or not. You get my point? Because roots are always buried. They are invisible realm. So you check yourself. Are you really applying? It is in application that roots grow. It is in application of the word that roots grow. When God wanted to give roots to, to Saul, he filled his life with instructions. From the day Saul was commissioned, remember Saul was not a man of the presence. So from the day Saul was commissioned, from the first day he was commissioned, the first instruction came. He said, go and wait for me at Gilgal. God surrounded his life with instructions. Why? God wanted to give a man who have no root some root. Remember, Saul was not processed to become king. 
he just stumbled into the mantle but david was processed for 13 years so they didn't step into the throne the same way so number one how do i develop root i should go for the knowledge of god number two i should apply the knowledge i know over time are you understanding me what did i say i didn't hear you can you add more strength to that it means you don't do it today and stop tomorrow. You don't do it on Monday. No. It has to be part of your life. So when you apply it over time, roots are formed. Roots are formed. You apply it against the devil, you'll be discouraged not to. You have to keep. You'll be discouraged not to. You have to keep. People could move against you. You remain strong. When you are resolute, the roots grow. When you are consistent, the roots grow. When you are consistent in what you are doing, when you are faithful in what you are doing, the roots grow. It's like in the relationship between you and your wife or your husband or whoever, maybe those of you who are still single, you are cutting, you are in courtship and stuff like that. Every relationship is strengthened when we remain faithful. To each other. Is somebody hearing me? Why is it necessary to be faithful? Can I tell you something? Our faithfulness is not tested when there's no problem. Faithfulness is not tested in the midst of peace. It's tested in the midst of war. If you say you are loyal to me and there's no reason to betray me, I should not believe you yet. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? If you say you are loyal to me, and there's no reason to betray me. I should not believe you yet. Let a reason come. If you don't betray me, I will not know you are. You are loyal. But if there's no reason, and you say I'm very loyal, shut up, shut up, wait. Wait first. Are you understanding me? Wait, wait, wait. You, you see, um, how many of you can do mandazi? Is it mandazi you call it? How many of you can do mandazi? Now, Mandazi is not mandazi until you enter the fire. <laughs> until you enter that oil and come out. A lot of things we boast about are not possible without the environment. For instance, I love you. Eh -eh. Don't say it until there's a reason to hate. It is when a reason to hate happens that we know whether you really love. I will remain with you until eh, eh, Jesus told Peter, wait, let the reason not to remain come. And the reason came. The reason not to remain with Jesus came. They all ran away. In fact, the Bible says, who ran and forgot his clothes? He ran, <laughs> he ran naked. <laughs> he, for, he forgot his clothes. Behind. <laughs> he, he ran naked away. You see, at this account, who have followed Jesus for three and a half years. They saw the miracles. They came back with signs and wonders. They lay on people. Himself. And by that night, when they reason, you see, everything we claim will be tested. Everything. If you say you are loving, don't say it yet. Until the object of your love mess you up. If you don't say me, I pray every day. Until the reason not to pray comes. When the reason not to pray comes, if you still pray, then we know if you pray. If you can pray without season. <laughs> you get my point? So, we must understand that our roots are developed when we are persistent. We are consistent. We are faithful. We don't bend the rules in the midst of the game. That is when there are develop. You cannot say you are faithful until you have served. You cannot say you are a virtue, or sorry, a, a, you are an asset to a ministry like this until you have done something to show. You get my point? You can also not say, ah, God, if only you will give me 10 million, I will give apostle until you show me what you have done with the 10 shillings. When the 10 shilling came, did you remember Apostle? If you never remember him, when it was 10 shilling, forget about 10 million. Because if you are faithful in the least, I will do what? You also be faithful what? 
I, I can't forget one guy who stood before me. That was 2016 when I got to know them. Oh, Apostle, the message you are preaching. Yeah, I just wish I have money. I just wish I have money. Up to today, the guy is still wishing. And his financial life have changed. He's still wishing. In fact, whenever he appears, he doesn't want me to see him. I say, this guy. <laughs> Selfish people. They always present themselves as we are ready to help. That's what the Bible says. Do you not believe people? It's a cause is he who trusts in what? Let's say in 2016 that we spoke, I put my trust in him. In those days when I was a baby preacher, what I do, when you come to me and tell me, Apostle, if only God will put, then it was uh, evangelist. Evangelist, if only God, you see this is your crusade. Just go and pray. I'm about going to the government to apply for this, for this contract. Just pray. Once they approve the contract, I will buy crusade equipment. He, son of man. I will stop eating. No? I will stop eating. I will go and start fasting. Praying. Calling on heaven and earth. <laughs> to respond. And God in his mercy will respond. As soon as the response come. Voicemail. Do you know <laughs> voicemail? The job disappeared. You don't see them again. I remember when he just bought a new car. He saw me walking around. Hey, 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 stop. Evangelist, how are you? Fine, sir. Wow, God is good. Amen. Keep going, eh? Keep going. <laughs> the Lord is with you. It is men of God like you we need. Don't worry. <laughs> the guy drove us. Look at this guy. He had forgotten the prayer point. So, 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 after all those experiences, I say me, don't try me. When you, when you say I should pray, I say you go and pray. You get my point? Because we've done all those stuff. No, no, no. Because a giver is a giver. Leave that thing. You don't need to pray for somebody to give. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You don't need to pray for someone to give. A giver, either he have or he doesn't have, he's, he's a giver. Just like a fish is a fish. Is that not? Any water you put fish, it will swim. Put the fish in the water that, that have stones, it will swim. Put a fish in a pond, it will swim. You get my point? So, 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 so that is how it's supposed to be. So when we are not persistent, we cannot develop roots. When we don't resist, that which comes to frustrate you, you also frustrate it. So how many have I given you? Two. Number one, what did I say? Knowledge. Number two, what did I say? Application. Number three, the thought where we develop rules is through the rigors of a process. The rigors of a process. You get my point? That process you, went, you go through in your work with God. Obedient process. You are told to obey God. You wait on him. So in such processes there is obedience. In such processes there is waiting upon the Lord. You get my point? Waiting upon the Lord helps you to develop roots. Are you, are you understanding me? Either in fasting or in other forms. When you wait upon the Lord you develop root. When you are not in a hurry. The process. You go through process. Do you know why Job had to go through the process he went through. Where he lost everything. Is because God wanted to give him root. One of the reasons was to give him root for the double portion that was coming. You get my point? Whenever God wants to give you a blessing, he will pass you through a process to develop the root for the blessing. Because when the blessing of God, for instance, as you're looking at me right now, your level, let's say financial blessings, the level of financial blessings you have now, it's according to the root you have now. So if God wants to give you something bigger, He has to develop your root. So that you can carry it. Are you, are you understanding me? There are people that if you give them only 10 million, they are out of the church. F just forget it. They are, they are just out of... Do you know that people have traveled just out of the country? Not that they went to heaven. They just went to... <laughs> they just went to the western country some uk some us and they forgot god they, they just forgot god though. 
They just wait. But when they were around, God was in trouble. Keshas, vigils, prayer. Before service starts, they have arrived. Before, when it closes, they stay behind. But when they just got their visas out, they told God, bye, 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 bye. There's a song we used to sing that in those days. Bye, bye, goodbye, Pharaoh. Goodbye, Pharaoh. Goodbye, Pharaoh. Bye, bye. So they were telling God, goodbye, Jehovah. Goodbye, Jehovah. Goodbye. And they flew. You want know, to tell you something? Any success your faithfulness gives you will need your faithfulness to keep. We need your faithfulness to keep. Because God will never bless us with what will break us. It depends on your covenant with God. He will never bless you. What you need faithfulness to get into certain blessings. And you need faithfulness to retain those blessings. Faithfulness. So the process we go through. Is someone hearing me? The process we go through before getting married. Will give you root for the marriage. If you skip the process, there will be no root for the marriage. Do you know why there's divorce? Marriages are breaking like biscuit. Because there's no root. People marry without root. They are like this. You get my point? This kind of tree. We'll go and meet this kind of tree. And two of them have no root. Husband, wife. Or wife, husband. I don't know. It depends on their sizes. Now... One day, only one mother-in-law will just come and carry the two of them like this and throw into a sea called divorce because there's no root. Are you understanding me? Life without root will be full of miseries. Christian life without root. Anything can carry. You will just be carried away by anything. May God give us root to survive the rigors of living in this generation. In the name of Jesus Christ. So, so the process that we go through to achieve something, give us the root to retain it. The process we go through to achieve something, gives us the root to do what? To retain it. So if we go through anything without process, there will be no root to retain that thing. So you must understand that one way we develop root is by going through the process. Look at what Job chapter 14 says. Verse 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my heart service. I love the Rock King James. Rock King James says, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait. Till what? My church comes. Why you are waiting all those days of appointed time? The hard things will be happening to you. Hard, hard things. When they happen, you develop root. Do you understand my point? When they happen, you develop the root for them. Many Christians, when we are going through hard time, we don't know that it's an environment for development of roots. Every hard time for a child of God is for you to grow your roots. Don't skip the process. Let God be true with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are some people that do not have root for financial prosperity. All the suffering they have seen in life have not helped them. Suffering is an asset for a wise man. I think I've preached. That, that is the message. If you, don't get, if you didn't get a new one, get that last one. Suffering is what? For who? But for a fool. You see, write, write it. Write that one before we talk more. Suffering is what? Suffering. Suffering is an asset. For 
for a wise man. But somebody who is not wise, no matter how they suffer, no matter how they suffer, they don't gain wisdom. There's a, there's, a, there's a scripture which I saw one of those days. It says, if you carry a fool and put in a mortar. Have you seen it? Yeah. The book of Proverbs. I know some of you don't read those ones. You are reading the Lord is my shepherd. It says, if you carry, it says, though you carry a fool and put in a mortar and pound. Do you know mortar? Do they have mortars in Kenya? He said, and you pound a fool like this. He said, it's foolish and I will not depart from them. There are people, you see, it's better to be sick than to be a fool. Because when you are sick, they will pray for you. But being a fool is not by prayer. Driving away foolishness, there are seven ways we drive foolishness. There's no time for me to talk about it. One of it is slap. <laughs> it's in the Bible, don't worry. I'll show you. One of it is what? Then the Bible says, use a rod and drive foolishness from a child. There are some people that have 50, but they are children. 40, they are children. 30, they are children. Some people are still total last at 45. 30 years. 26, 25, 20. You see, in God's design, from seven years, you should cease being a child. Seven. But you, your own have expired. <laughs> you are past seven years. You are still a child. Because foolishness. The Bible says it abounds there. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. If your suffering is not giving you wisdom, you are a fool in a mortar. Satan is pounding you. He will keep pounding. If your suffering is not giving you wisdom, suffering is an asset for the wise. You wake up with the money, there's no money to eat. It should give you wisdom. What happened to me? At this age, I'm not eating. What's the problem? A fool will start blaming people. Because my mother didn't send me to school. At least he has pushed you out. You are no longer in her belly. <laughs> are you? Are you understanding? You are no longer in her belly. If, if, you, if she didn't do anything, she did one thing. She didn't let you to remain in the womb. That is an achievement. You get my point? So you've been pushed out. Now take care of yourself. You better study the life of eagles, the life of certain birds, the life of certain insects. As soon as they come out, they begin to fend for themselves. They don't begin to, so, so, so why is it that animals are wiser than us? Listen carefully. If your suffering is not increasing your wisdom, please, you need an encounter with Jesus to give you a wise heart. The Bible says, whoever lacks wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask. Spend time to pray for wisdom. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because the process of time, it's why hardship. He said, all the days of my heart service, I will wait till my change come. How will heart service bring change? Because you applied wisdom to the hardness. The hardness was teaching you wisdom. The hardness was teaching you wisdom. It was guiding you. Can I tell you something? If you have 10,000 in your hand and the thing disappeared, you didn't know where it went to. It's not the Midianite. Before you start going to mountains to pray. It is your expenditure process. You are not disciplined. For some, they have more needs than supply. Their appetite is so huge. When they want to eat, they forget that they are not children of the rich. Somebody who is a child of the rich physically, hey, hey, he can go to the porch, this, buy that, buy this. Maybe if you go to a restaurant, the first thing he do, he asks for the dessert and eat that one first. And then relax and bet a little. And then say, can I have some cups of this? And they bring a bet a little. He can spend 10000 and go, no problem. But you don't try it. You get my point? God lived the poor from the dung here. And set them among praises. Listen carefully. Some people do not have economic roots. And because you don't have economic roots. Money does not stay in your hands. 
Anything without a root is like this tree. Is that not? Money does not stay because you don't have economic root. Now, what are the roots that will guarantee our economic stature? One of it is financial discipline. Financial discipline is going to guarantee your economic stature. Financial discipline. Number two, having a sense of productivity. A good sense of productivity will establish your economic life. It's, it's a major route. Somebody who has financial discipline, give that person one million. Come on, he will multiply it. Or oh, even a thousand, even, even ten thousand. Even on the, they will just multiply. The most frustrating people are those that money appear in their hands. In fact, somebody who doesn't have economic root, free, don't give them anything free. People do not have value over the things they get freely. Anybody who does not value what they get freely, their poverty will be perpetual. People who can multiply wealth are those who value either they got it freely or they labor for it. They can tell you this thing is of value. So because it has value, I will spend it like water. I will sit down to think. What kind of spiritual roots here? So if there's no economic root, finances disappear from your hands. Is someone hearing me? So how many have I given you? Number one is what? Number two. Now, the third economic route that will help you is healthy interpersonal relationships. Money comes through people, not spirits. Healthy interpersonal relationship. Do not harbor a devourer. You see, eh? The best form of relationship is symbiotic relationship. I was studying the, uh, one of our footballers. He, he was giving, he made it just two days ago, I'll be last week. He made, a, he, he had an interview. And though I may not subscribe to what he said, but it made a little sense. He said, the guy is very rich. He's very rich. He, he earns very well. He now said that people who knew him said he's not into frivolity, he's not into carrying women or drinking or whatever, whatever. So, and he doesn't like fame. So, somebody was testifying about that, and he himself said, he said, he said, he said, yes, I have money, but any woman who is not bringing anything on the table, then I have no business. Though they are not born again, they're just talking like that. Now, if you look at it, me, I, I saw it in a different light. I saw it as in my interpersonal relationship it should be based on symbiotic um, benefits. In another word, if I am killing mosquito from your hand, you get my point? If I'm killing mosquito from your I saw mosquito that is in your hand and I'm killing it, you should check anyone that is flying around my hand. You understand what I'm saying? Do you see my, my parable? If I'm killing a mosquito in your hand, you should check anyone flying around my line. So now, if I'm killing a mosquito in your hand, and you're not, and you're not checking the one flying in my own hands, that is parasitic. Is someone hearing me? If I'm giving you a cup of water, you should ask me, have you taken? Have you drunk? You should be concerned about me also drinking it. Symbiotic relationship is a relationship of mutual benefit. It may not be the same thing. You see, it may be benefiting money from the, you may be, you may be benefiting financially from the person, but you, the person is benefiting in, a, in other form from you. But it should not be a relationship where you alone benefit or he or she alone benefit. Is somebody hearing me? Any relationship where one person benefit, that person, one person is going to die before the other one. What am I saying? In economy, when it comes to economic growth, polish your interpersonal relationships and make them symbiotic. This is where people enter into agreement before they go into businesses. 
they check what will be my benefit i want to be your benefit there's nothing wrong with checking like that don't speak in tongues on those matters sit yes we are in the same church we worship under the same man of god yes we know the same jesus but this one is about money sit down as we go into this business how much will i make how much will you get we have to agree before we take the first step is somebody hearing me symbiotic relationship are very important having healthy interpersonal relation is a major root jesus said the children of this world are wiser why because they cultivate such relationship so that when they have problems people can come for their rescue are you understanding me also if you want to invest in people invest in good grounds invest in good hearts do good to good people that will remember do you understand me don't be like a farmer who is scattering his seed everywhere do good to people that can remember they are ingrate that prosperity dies in their hands i've never seen an ungrateful person prosper have you seen one if they prosper is temporal develop roots there are other roots which are spiritual economic root talking about your relationship with god number number five talking about your wisdom level i've given you how many I've me- I just mentioned two in one minute, in less than one minute. I said relationship with God, is that not? And I said wisdom, wisdom level, is that not? That's number five. Number six, we call that business acumen. That's the ability to develop ideas that will bring in money. Ability to manage your business productively. Business acumen. Bright financial ideas that comes into your spirit. Those are roots. So, how many things have I given on how to develop roots? Number one, knowledge. Number two, application. Number three, divine process. Is that not? Number four, we develop our roots to prayer and fasting. I know I've lost some of you. We develop our roots, how? Oh, yes. When we pray to the point of finding mercy to help us in time of need. Hallelujah. There's a way grace comes from God. And the grace of God becomes our root. Is someone hearing me? We obtain mercy in the place of prayer to find grace in time of need. So your prayer need has a lot of role to play to you having roots in life. People who pray and they spend time with God is difficult for the winds of life to blow them away. Oh yes, I've seen that so much. Sometimes the midst of intensive attacks, you have to learn to lock yourself before God and ask the Lord for grace. Ask the Lord to show you mercy. Is somebody hearing me? Ask the Lord for mercy. Ask the Lord for grace. And while you are praying and you are seeking Him, I mean, demonstrating your helplessness, telling Him, without you, we can't. The way David did, develop your helplessness. When He came down, remember? In, I think first, uh, the last chapter of First Samuel, the last two chapters, when the Amalekites came and took away everything, and the Bible said they wept until they became tired, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. When such thing hit you everywhere, and you have no way to even turn to, please turn to the Lord. Develop root because that storm that came came to carry you. Bend your knees down before God in prayer and let him sustain you that is how god manifests as our pillar is somebody hearing me as our shelter as and as our refuge you cannot say god is your shelter if you don't know how to run to him for help do you hear what i'm saying you cannot say god is your shelter if you don't know how to do what that is why we come here midweek service we are praying today we we'll ask the lord cover me if there's anything in your life that you want help for this is the time for us to pray and ask the lord for mercy lord i want to find grace concerning this matter give me mercy grant me mercy so that let, i want to obtain the mercy tonight to find grace in this area of need this area is blowing me away this area is blowing me away i need a help from you Prayer and fasting is a major catalyst of, of, of divine help. And those things help us to develop stability. Sometimes you get confused. What creates confusion? Confusion is a product of actually thought systems. 
thought systems within us are the root of confusion. So when you enter the place of prayer and you pour your soul to the Lord, there's a way his presence comes into your thought and realign them. Gives you confidence. May God visit you tonight. May God visit us tonight. So let's be on our feet and pray. Let's, 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 let's touch the Father through our prayer tonight. And let's receive some strength from him concerning the issues of our lives. To the mountain of the Lord we go. We go to the mountain of the Lord we go. With the prayers, with the prayers of the saints around us to the mountain of the Lord we go. Oh, hallelujah to the mountain of the Lord we go. We go to the mountain of the Lord. up your hands and begin to thank him for the word that has come tonight. If God has given us insight in any way, if he has taught us, if I have opened our eyes, let's thank him. It's out of his mercies that we are not consumed. Just lift up your voice and appreciate him. Lima makende lima bosete le kabasatalia. Liba baba kende lima bosete le kayaba. Liba bakanda lima brosete le. Liba bakende lima basata le kayaba. Come on, come on, lift up your voice and pray right now. Let the Lord hear your voice tonight. Let the Lord hear your voice tonight. Lima kabo se tele kaya ba 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 ba. Lima kama se tele ba satalia. Re ba ba kedele pa se tele kaya ba. There is something to cry out to God tonight for. To, he said, "I will sh- sh- show mercy to whom I will show mercy." Ma kile kabo satalia. Pray. While you're in the mood of prayer, I'll put to Psalm 103. As we lift up our voice tonight, let's stand on this scripture. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, near, blessed Lord, to the precious bleeding side. Draw me near, draw me near, oh, near, blessed. Yeah. 
said, said, Lord, oh, to the precious, please, draw me near, you are my helper, your blessed Lord, to the cross. Psalm 103 verse 13 As a father pities his children I never believe believed this word As a father pities his children Say with me I have a father Say again I have a father He is the almighty father He is the king of kings He is the lord of lords He is my father and the Bible now says, as he pities his children, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. There are things that may be trying to break you, but God knows. We're going to pray right now. What is it that is trying to break you financially, spiritually, morally? God knows. Lift up your voice. And stand on this scripture and tell the Lord, have mercy upon me tonight and restore back my broken life. Restore back my broken economy. Restore back my broken morality. Restore back my broken morality. Restore back my broken prosperity. Restore back my broken peace. Restore me back. I am broken. I am broken, oh God, restore me back. Lord, restore me back, I am broken. Restore back my broken life. Restore back my broken prosperity, my broken morality. Restore back the broken parts of my life. Send the flames of your spirit right now. Let your mercy be upon us tonight to restore back any frame of our life that is broken. Restore back the broken me. Restore back the broken me. Reach out in your mercy and raise me back on my feet. Reach out in your mercy and restore back the broken me. Lima kaba sata lima ya baba baba. Leka li brosete leka la basata lia. Eka li masi le baba kede le basata lia. Lo restore me back. Lo restore me back. Restore back the broken me. The broken part of my life. Let it be restored. Open your mouth and call unto your father. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. Lord, restore back the broken parts of my life. Reach out in your mercy. There is something in your life that you want God to do. Call upon him right now. It could be concerning your business, concerning your family, concerning your children. This is a time to pray concerning your economy, concerning your morality, concerning your prosperity, concerning your integrity, whatever it is. Father, I pray that you hear my cry tonight. Oh, in Kalima say, take a lepro Satalia. Reba Baba 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 Baba. In Kalabo Satalia. Lee Kalabro Satele Bayaba. Lord restore me back. 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 
in your mercy restore me back in your mercy restore me back oh ancient of days restore me back restore every broken part of my life every broken part of my life restore me Lord, restore me. Let restore me. The broken part of my life. My broken morality. My broken economy. My broken prosperity. My broken morality. My broken prosperity. Lord, restore back every part of my life that is broken. You understand my frame. As a father pities the children, so you pity those who fear you. Lift up your voice and tell him, Lord, you understand my frame. Reach out in your mercy. Reach out in your mercy, O oh God, and restore me. Oh, my Kali, my Satali, my As the Lord for a helping hand, 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 as the Lord for a helping hand. Ask the Lord for a helping hand. Lift up your voice and ask him. Lord help me. Lord help me. Lord help me. Lord help me. Reach out in your mercy and help me. Give me the roots I need to survive. Give me the economic roots I need. Help me to grow roots. So that I will not be a rootless tree. I will not be a tree without roots. I want to have roots to resist the spiritual roots to resist to resist the enemy to resist negative influences oh laka ma setele ba ya ba ba e kalibra satale ma ya ba ba laka la mo setele ko po setele le ba 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 kedele kala mo sotolia re ba 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 kedele kala bra satalia Come on, come on, come on, lift up your voice. Come on, come on, come on, lift up your voice. Lord, grant me the root, the root to resist, the root, the spiritual roots I need to resist. To resist the enemies of my salvation, to resist the enemies of my calling, to resist the enemies of my will to do your will. The root to resist the demonic, 
to resist the flesh the spiritual roots i need to resist the flesh to resist sin
Savior, ever near to guide me. I am safe, whatever may be tied me from the storms and tempest evil.
come to the front as we wrap up this prayer. In the hollow of his hands, in the hollow of his hands, we are saved from ever betide us. In the Of his hands, he can love us yet Of his hands, we are saved. Oh, beloved, we tied us in the hood Stretch up can stop the enemy. 
awake, awake, O arm of the Lord upon our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Lift up your two hands as we pray. Father, we lift up our hands in total surrender to your will, to your power, to your power that saves, to your mercy, O oh God. I bring everyone under the sound of my voice before your throne. You are the shepherd of this house. You are the shepherd of every one of us. We are the sheep of your pasture. Wherever we have sold ourselves to the wicked one, redeem us right now. Let the enemy, oh God, not have a resting place in our lives. We call on your mercy tonight. To restore back every broken part of our lives. We want to have root to resist. We want to have root to neutralize the demonic. We want to have the root to resist the wicked. We want to have the root to resist the wicked. We want to have the root to resist the wicked. We want to have the root to resist the wicked, Lord. Therefore, let your mercy be upon us tonight. Let your mercy be one of our roots. Let your mercy be one of our survivor roots. In the name of Jesus. You said to your word, you will have mercy on whom you have mercy. And you will have compassion on whom you have compassion. Let your mercy be upon us tonight. That as we leave this place tonight, we live with portions of your mercy. Dimensions of your grace. To fight in time of need in the name of Jesus restore back every broken morality restore back every broken prosperity restore back every broken integrity restore back every one of us oh God in the name of Jesus let there be no breaking in or breaking out among us Lord let there be no breaking in and broken out among us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. That everyone who has been overwhelmed, strength in the name of Jesus. Anyone who lack resistance, strength in the name of Jesus. That we live tonight as vessels bearing the oil of grace. Bearing the oil of grace. Bearing the oil of grace. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, bless you. you. can go back to your seat. Hallelujah. We're going to give our offerings right now. Shepherd of my soul. I give you full control Wherever you may live, I will go home. I have made a choice To listen to your voice Wherever you I will go Be through the quiet pastures By the gentle stream Shepherd of my soul Be my guide I, Should I face the mighty mountain Ali Dakanti, Shepherd of my soul, be my God. You are the Shepherd of my soul.
every fiber of our being, oh God, and let this lead to the development of economic roots in our lives. In the name of Jesus, thank you for your word that has opened our eyes tonight. Thank you for refreshing and renewal. We commit the rest of the week into your hands. We pray that let your miracles pursue us. Let your mercy pursue us. In the name of Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. You can give your offerings. Should I face the mighty mountain? The valley dark and deep. shall it be in our lives in the name of Jesus. Let's put hands together for Jesus as we have our seat. Hallelujah. By God's grace on Friday we will have our vigil from 9 p.m. is the arrival time. So when you come 9 o'clock you get yourself ready and we now start whenever during the period. So remind our friends, our brethren, and uh, as we announced on Sunday, it will not be transmitted. But those who are outside Nairobi can request for the link by sending your email address to 0718, I think 
when you send your email there we'll be able to put you in the link do that before friday so that we can get the link ready praise god i'm many of you are blessed coming tonight may god sustain you Amen. and preserve you Amen. at this midweek service they are very important to our faith is it not are they helping you to stabilize hallelujah I pray that the wisdom that we have learned tonight will speak in our life forever will remain eternal in us in the name of Jesus even as we go tonight may the angels of the Lord watch over us and may they bring us back here safely on Friday in the name of Jesus Christ let's share the grace may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Thank you for participating with us in our live service. Be sure to join us again next time. Keep watching Morning Cloud